Uh, today we are very happy to have a uh, Professor Peter Lee from MIT. As many of you know, he is a uh, godfather in some of you know. We should uh, stay in first. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I also don't recognize who that person is. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, yeah, I'd like to uh, tell you today something about the uh, Trinity Quiz, and uh, uh, particularly the gap in uh, uh, variety and uh, how it's related to gauge theory. So, a lot of it is, uh, is uh, a review because I'm not sure what the audience uh, is, but uh, it will be something new mostly on the uh, uh, recent experimental development. Uh, um, yeah, so what I hope to do is to just introduce to you the concept of uh, quantum spin liquid and how the uh, gauge theory uh, naturally emerges as a way to describe uh, these spin liquids and uh, just mention some of the theoretical issues that we've developed uh, over the years. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about the experimental realization of spin liquid. Now, the subject is going to be very large. Uh, there are many, many examples. So I would uh, concentrate on the gapless variety. You know, they're taking cover either uh, gap or, or gapless. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, it's actually easier to find experimental consequences of gapless uh, spin liquid. Uh, because a spin liquid is uh, sometimes defined by what it does not do. Right, that's not uh, uh, ordering and so on. So it's a little frustrating. You don't know what to measure. Right. Whereas the gap is variety, you can uh, really uh, uh, if something new. You can do experiment. Right? And um, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, you know, historically there have been several examples, but in the last couple of years, uh, I think we have uh, come upon a, a new uh, example which is very promising, and particularly. Uh, th uh, this uh, may allow you to do a lot more experiments than previous examples. So I'm quite excited about that. And, uh, I'll close by asking what, what are the open questions and what, what experiments are you making. And um, so, <coughs> there, there are, there are two uh, very recent reviews uh, which are very good that I can recommend to you. In particular, the one by Savari and uh, Alex. I, I was uh, reading it in preparation for the talk, so when I read it, I, I don't need to give this talk. This that people need to review. It has a lot of insight, so I have really. Uh, yeah, so uh, back to the beginning. Um, um, I think the story can start with the uh, idea of mod insulator. Um, so this is a situation where you have one carrier per, per site. So in the solid state system, we have a lattice, and we can uh, have electrons a whole um, uh, that are uh, on, on the side, and they can uh, hop around with a hopping integral, which is called T. And in fact, if you read the uh, elementary uh, solid state physics book, they will tell you that the hopping will, will form a band, right, a conduction band. And the band can accommodate uh, two electrons because of up and down spin. So, but if you have one electron per site, then the band is over half filled. And so you're guaranteed that the chemical potential will cut the Fermi surface, will cut the band. So you, you have a Fermi surface and you have a metal. Right? So according to band theory, if you read Chicago or F. Robert Merman, they will tell you that this is a uh, metal. But in practice, uh, we have many examples where these are instant. Okay. And uh, so that was, that's, these are called modern states. So whenever you have an odd number of uh, carriers uh, per good itself, uh, these are called. And, and it's insulating, it's called modern The physics is uh, really due to strong correlation, and the band theory does not take account, into account uh, sufficiently the Coulomb repulsion between <coughs> electrons. So the electrons really hate each other. Uh, that's the fundamental principle of strong correlation. So they, they can't. Uh, so when, when you put two of them on the same side, it costs you a large energy, which is called U. Okay? And so if U is large enough, then you will overcome the desire to, to move around. And they just sit still. Right? So the electrons become the new state. So we have, uh, when they sit still, then we still have a remaining degrees of freedom with the 
So the charge between the freedom is frozen now. There's no uh, uh, gapless charge fluctuation. There's, so we say that there's a charge gap. But there may or may not be a spin gap because the spin are free to, to, to fluctuate, but not quite. Uh, you can see that uh, by virtually hopping to the na neighbor, uh, you can gain uh, an, an energy, uh, which is t squared over u, just by the second order of equation theory, if the spins are anti-parallel. But if they are parallel, then Pauli says that you can't even gain that energy. So there is a, a tendency towards uh, anti parallel So that's the setting for this. So very often we map this into a Heisenberg model of spin. Right? So, so this is how you form local moments to form local moments. And uh, they have this um, uh, anti parallel exchange in so actually, go, if you go back in history, in the, in the 1950s, um, there was a kind of a debate between Mott and Slater. You know, Slater was a founder of uh, band theory. And uh, Mott says that, okay, we have this, I have my, 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 my insulator, right? But Slater says, well, not, not too fast. Your insulator is actually kind of trivial. Right? Because he says that, well, if I have anti magnet, the anti magnet would form a new unit cell, right? Suppose that in a square lattice, I would double the unit cell. So then in the new unit cell, then you have two electrons per, per side, and you have a band insulator, conventional insulator. So what's the big deal, right? Uh, yeah. So, um, so that's the, the question. And I think over the years, I think we, we certainly believe that Mod has won the, won the battle. Right? <laughs> uh, so we live up, we make a living off of Mod. Right? So, uh, but I think it's an interesting question. You know, can we have a bond insulator that does not have an anti -propane? So that would be the kind of ideal of bond insulator. Right? So then, then Slater you know, would not have any proof of objection. Right? But this is really a new thing. Okay. <clears throat> so I think that's the question. Can we have a situation where it's local moment and um, and it doesn't double in itself? So we don't, it doesn't work. Right? So that's one way of approaching this idea of spin liquid. Spin liquid would be such a state right, where we have this one spin per unit cell and it doesn't order, it doesn't double unit cell. Okay. This liquid has a name to, to say that this is some kind of an amorphous, there's no structure to it. Okay. I think the name was introduced by, by Anderson in 1973 in a rather obscure paper. Uh, he was coming in from a different angle and he was trying to say that if there's frustration for the uh, 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 anti interaction, can you avoid this uh, corneal order anti -propane? So frustration happens, for example, on the triangle lattice. Right? Because if you have one spin is up, uh, the other two spins don't know which way to turn. Right? Because, so, so that's called frustration. And so his idea is that due to a frustration, and if you have quantum fluctuation at zero temperature, the spins uh, may be just fluctuating uh, all the time, and you may form a single ground state by linear superposition of single parts instead of uh, uh, making this uh, nail state. So that's called a uh, 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 RVB state, a wave uh, bond, uh, resonating wave bond in, in analogy with, uh, with graphite, uh, carbon bond. Uh, so the pictorial representation is that you may have uh, nearest neighbor singlets that need to spawn up, down, minus, down, up. And you can make, you can, you can uh, tile the lattice with your singlet, and of course there are infinite number of ways of doing this, and then you can just leave a clean position. So you end up with a uh, uh, some kind of entangled state. Now these these bonds don't have to be short range; they can be long range. When it's short range, then it's obviously a gap system because the ground state would be a single ground state, maybe, and then you have a, a gap excitation. Uh, but if you have long range, then it could be gapless. Right? So, so those are <clears throat> right. So the requirement is that we have an insulator and we have an odd number of electrons. So we have a, a spin a half, a, odd, a half integer spin, and uh, it doesn't work. Right? When you have integer spin, it, then it becomes trivial again because uh, uh, I can form a basic with zero. Uh, um, <clears throat> so why are we interested in this uh, subject? And I think mainly because this is a the prime example of the concept of convert lab conversions, right? Namely, this, uh, uh, and uh, I think this may, may, may not have been fully appreciated by, by Anderson back then, because uh, what we now know is that when this happens, the spin liquid is not trivial, right? And 
there would be a new particles that showed up uh, that were not there in the original entropy, such as fermions and carries with the half of spinons and, and bosons and so on. And there may be uh, gauge fields uh, that, that shows up. It could be U1 gauge field, it could be C2 gauge field. So all these new particles emerge at low energy, uh, which were not there. Because we started with the spin model, the spin was only a spin degree of three. So that's uh, uh, something new. <coughs> um, um, somewhat like the fractional quantum hall effect where a fractional charge of but they were not there. And so these, uh, these concepts were uh, met with a lot of resistance uh, early on because people were just too foreign and too, too strange. But nowadays, uh, thanks to some exact, uh, exactly soluble notably by the back in time, uh, I think now people accept that uh, such a state can exist in, in principle. It's mathematically they can exist. They are explicit spin level dominant, which does show this, uh, which demonstrate all these uh, ideas. Um, so I think these are really like the Ising model of the units that I think did for, for the phase transition. In the old days, people didn't, didn't even believe the singularities are, are possible. So, so that's a, a very important step. And so I, I, can, I can rest it, you know, I can sleep at night. Knowing that this, this is possible. <coughs> right. <coughs> okay, so uh, let me just let's go through quickly the formal theory uh, of how, how this gauge theory uh, emerges. It, 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 this is a very simple uh, construction <coughs> and um, it dates back really uh, um, already in the 80s, uh, late 80s. <coughs> and um, so uh, this is sometimes called a part on uh, construction. And the idea is that uh, we extend the Hilbert space. And then the gauge field would uh, emerge as naturally as to enforce a constraint. So let's start with a simple Heisenberg model. So there's a local moment spin and a half operator on each side. Uh, so these are this will be quantum uh, spin and a half uh, with some exchange uh, interaction. And so the idea is to write the spin uh, in terms of fermions. We introduce you do some fictitious fermion, uh, one one up and one down on each side. So each side. Is and the fermion. Of course, then we know how to write the spin operator in terms of fermions. And in fact, we can write then, so it's a bilinear, so this is a, is a, is a, is a, is a fourfold, a fourth term fermion. But there's a catch to this, right? The catch is that uh, because we have killed the charge degrees of freedom, right, the fermions cannot move. Right? So there's only one per second to represent it, a local spin. So therefore, the uh, total number of uh, uh, Fermions on each side is one. Right? So each, on each side you see the up, up, spin, up fermion and down fermion. It cannot be two, it cannot be zero. Okay, so that's the constraint. So, so it looks like we map it to a somewhat simpler problem uh, with fermions. Because you know we cannot, uh, there's no, um, it's good to work with fermions of boson because they're um, waste there, right? But there's no waste there for, for, for spin. So this is already a, a step forward. But you pay a big price. That there, there is this constraint. Okay. However, if you can enforce a constraint exactly on each side, then this is actually a faithful representation of the original spin problem. Because there's no approximation here. So again, we we expand the unit cell and then uh, um, and and, and then enforce <coughs> a constraint. Uh, the first question you ask is so why why fermion? Well, we could have done the same thing with bosons right, as well. Uh, and those are called Schrodinger bosons. And um, however, uh, for, at least for this talk, uh, fermion is a better language because when you have bosons, bosons have the trouble that they want to condense. They like to condense. So, so you really have only two choices: either the boson condense or they are gapped. Right. Right. And uh, so if they condense, that corresponds to where they are all. If they are gapped, then I may form a gap spin But my my job today is to talk about gap spin so it's very difficult to describe capitalist spin liquid if you start with a boson representation. Therefore, a fermion representation is good. I mean, this gives rise gives you a more general question. You know, there are many, many ways to formulate this problem. Why do you choose this one or that one? You know, what, what motivates you? Right? And there are many mean field theories. So really, the open question is which mean field theory is close to the truth? I mean, from my old-fashioned way of understanding things, I think. By understanding, I mean, what I mean is that I have a simple picture. And that simple picture is usually some kind of mean field theory, right? 
Now, if mutual theorem would be done in some fancy way, but still, understanding means reducing something to, to something elementary. So that may be an old fashioned way, but yeah, it's okay. Uh, right. So we have no systematic way to tell ahead of time uh, which is better, right? Which formulation is better. We cannot predict. So generally, the problem with this whole approach is that we cannot predict the ground state, starting with the microscopic. We don't, we don't know how to do that. Um, right now, the only way we can maybe try to do that is by numerics. But what we can do is to try to classify and describe the states. So, so what we, our, our goal is not to be, have, be able to predict uh, what kind of ground state emerges, but simply to say what are possible, what are the possibilities. And given the possibility, we want to describe the physical properties. So it's a rather more modest goal. Um, but here we might not need to preach to the converted <laughs> I think Sean got has converted all of you <laughs> into this way of thinking. <laughs> I blame him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, since our goal is to describe gamma spin liquid, we will proceed with the first so. Okay. So, so the, the next step is that we have a we have a um, we have a um, constraint. So it's natural to enforce the constraint by introducing an apparatus multiply, which is called that. So in the, uh, in the particle formulation, we just introduce something like this. So obviously, if we integrate over this uh, constraint, which is on each side, then this lambda, then we recover the constraint. All right. Um, and, and this four fermion term really invites us to uh, some kind of mean field decomposition. So, so terms of this, they can be written in this way, and it invites some, some kind of a decomposition into a hopping term. Remember, initially, the fermions are totally low price, they cannot move, right? So I can introduce a, some kind of a, a hopping term or even a pairing term, right? And I can do that formally by introducing some hubble strafanovich conservation to turn this quadric term into quadratic term, right? So, so far, it, it, it is exact, uh, plus some delta i term. But if you look at this, Problem, then you immediately see that uh, this is a gauge theory, right? Because the the chi i j is in general complex, and the phase of this would be a would be a, a complex hopping, right? So this this gives you if you hop around a plaquette, it will pick up some flux, right? So so this is a uh, u1 gauge compact u1 gauge theory, and this uh, um, um, uh, Lagrange multiplier becomes the uh, time component. So you can see immediately that the the problem in this formulation uh, becomes a problem of fermion that is strongly coupled to V1 case. Why strongly? Well, in fact, it is even worse, right? Because it's, it's actually infinitely coupled. Because we introduce this as a constraint, so there's no restoring force, right? There's no uh, there's no maximal term in the beginning. Right? So these gauge fields are freely fluctuating. It doesn't cause it anything. To to fluctuate. So this is a very bad situation. Right? So we have a, we introduce an object that is totally wild. Right? So how do you control that? Well, we could play some simple trick. If you integrate out the high energy uh, uh, fermions, then you can generate some kind of a maximal term. Right? Uh, and then and then you can and argue that the coupling constant is not infinite, but for the one. And so we have a strong coupling problem. But one is still bad for, for most uh, uh, physicists. Um, yeah, we want a small number. So, but unfortunately, we have to live with this one, right? Okay. Yeah. So, coupling cost. So, we have to deal with a strong. So, the problem we are faced with is a is a strongly coupled uh, gauge theory with uh, with metaphy. Now, to, to make progress, we can uh, we can try different uh, several point solutions. Look at different mean fields. So, there are several that uh, uh, we can look at. Uh, so we can assume this this hopping is real. The cell point is a real hopping. In that case, uh, then we have a Fermi C. Right? The fermion is just hopping just like anything else. So we have a Fermi C coupled to the cage field. Or we can have some, uh, if it is complex, uh, there's something called high flux space where you can uh, create a half of uh, flux uh, in each plaquette. And that has a direct spectrum. Um, or you can have pairing terms. The, the fermions can pair. Uh, in which case we have either gap or a direct spectrum, and those would, be, would become Z two gauge theory because once you're pairing, because you, you just 
destroy the new ones in the tree. Okay. So these are all things that we know uh, from our experience with actually electrons that can, can be carried to these uh, fermions. So these, once you do this, then these fermions uh, have a name, they're called spin-ons. <coughs> Somehow, when you give something a name, it becomes legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> and so now they're just theoretical constructs. So now we want to argue that they're actual particles. They're alive. So, what what is the what is the condition to make them alive? So the, the enemy of, of, of a spin liquid is confinement. So the gauge, yeah, as you know, the gauge uh, theory, lattice gauge theory, has to, in general, have two possibilities: either confine or or decomfine. If it's confined, it means that Everything is being tied up <coughs> together. This is a gauge neutral object. And the only gauge neutral objects are original spin. Right? So that and then these fermions are you know, they show up for a little bit and then they, they get tied down again, right? Like quarks. So so they are not legitimate. But if there's a confined phase, then these guys uh, even though they were introduced as fictitious objects, become real. Become yeah, real objects. Okay. That takes on a life of the world. However, the warning is that even if they are confined, that doesn't mean that they are free. Right? They are still strongly coupled to the, to the gauge. Right? So even in that case, the problem is not, not trivial. The background state is, not, is highly not true. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. So as I said now, thanks to this exactly soluble model, the existence of spin liquid state, that the possibility of the confinement is no longer in doubt. Right. But. There's still many open questions about uh, this property of these uh, confined uh, states. Okay. So the problem now reduces to uh, the problem of compact U1 gauge theory or the lattice, uh, lattice gauge theory in 2 plus 1 dimension. Right? So that's how uh, we have uh, tried our problem with this one, strong couple. Well, what do we know? Well, we know that uh, if there's no matter here, if the if they both if the fermions are all gap, then the field gauge theory is always confined in 2 dimensions. <laughs> And the mechanism of confinement is the proliferation of instant particles. Classical, classic paper by by body Now, so this seems uh, very bad news, right? However, I think the presence of matter field gives us hope, right? Because that's something that was not considered by by body There are some low-lying uh, fermions. So physically, you can say that the fermions uh, carry gauge charge, so they generate electric field, gauge electric field. And since electric field and magnetic fields are are conjugate, uh, these can tend to sub suppress uh, magnetic fluctuation, which is responsible for instant parts. Yeah, so that's the whole thing that, that happened. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what do we know now? Um, so I think I think I think these two things we we have uh, reasonably uh, sure of. Uh, in the case where we have uh, uh, the, the fermions form a <coughs> direct spectrum. Right, so now we do some mean field theory and produce a, a spectrum for the for the, uh, for the, for the, the spin-ons. In the high fast phase that I showed the spectrum, they have these uh, little background beam and they have these uh, direct uh, uh, dispersion. And then we can consider an SUN generalization of that. Right? So let's consider n copies of these direct points. Okay. So that's one of the standard trick people use uh, when, when you face with the problem. And uh, so. Um, uh, there was some there was a, some um, controversy about whether this problem has a deconfined phase or not, even in the large end limit. But I think this paper uh, settled that. This is a large end paper, and refers to the number of authors. Uh, so there are six of us. Uh, so we, I thought we have safety in numbers. And uh, so uh, I think this this paper showed that uh, I think quite an ambiguous the, that the. Uh, um, that the um, scaling dimension of instantons uh, becomes irrelevant for a large enough n. So we're sure that if, if n is large enough, then we can have a deconfined phase. Okay. Now, what is the critical value of n? I think it's not known right now. Right. Now, for example, in the pi flux phase, the n there is, is 4. So whether that qualifies, or not, we, we don't know. Right? So I think that's one of the open questions uh, in the field. So, um, let to find out what this critical value now, in, in the case of spin on Fermi surface, a uh, couple of one gauge theory, uh, then intuitively it seems clear that deconfinement is possible because if, it, if it's n copies of direct points have enough matter to, to deconfine, then a full Fermi surface uh, have a much more low-lying excitation. And that's true. 
Uh, I, I think it was proven uh, again, uh, quite rigorously by Sophie Lee, Lee, um, who mapped the fundamental the, the Fermi surface problem into an uh, infinite number of uh, chiral fermions, which is quite natural, right? Because each direction uh, is a chiral fermion. And uh, so it's basically an uh, n equal infinity number of chiral fermions. And then he showed that uh, uh, he can have the short time. So I think now we are quite uh, comfortable that uh, it's not proven in a mathematical status problem, but we're quite comfortable that, uh, that these are consigned. So now the problem now, hopefully, if you accept that the confinement is possible, the problem reduces to non-compact U1 case. Uh, coupled to a surface, for example. So now we don't have to worry about uh, confinement or in Right? OK. So the spin-offs now live in a world which is coupled to some fluctuating uh, 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 U1 gauge theory, just like in our world, electrons are coupled to electromagnetic radiation. The only difference is that the speed of light is now very slow because it's controlled by, by an exchange interaction. And the longitudinal fluctuations are harmless because just like in our world, uh, Coulomb interactions are screened. But, and and we, we have a finite density of spin-off, so they can screen the gauge charge. So the only thing dangerous are the transverse magnetic field fluctuations, right? Because current fluctuation cannot be screened. Um, so physically, the physical meaning of gauge field uh, is the is a magnetic flux through a plaquette. Uh, and uh, Xiao Gang again a uh, long time ago showed that this uh, is proportional to this uh, concept of scalar chirality. Right? So in other words, you take you take three spins and construct this uh, solid angle uh, between them, and that uh, object is the uh, that solid angle is the, is the gauge. Right. So that's the physical meaning of this gauge. In terms of spinless energy. Now, what are the physical consequences? So early on, we recognized that this, uh, uh, because of coupling the gauge fluctuation, uh, the specific heat of the fermion goes as e to the two-third power. Right. So this looks like a non-Fermi liquid, because uh, in, a, in a Fermi liquid, the uh, heat goes as linear T. Right. So this says you have an infinite mass. Okay. And that comes from uh, just uh, at least transverse gauge fluctuation, because the transverse gauge fluctuation is very soft. Uh, okay. uh, so I think this, this result still more or less stands, as far as I know. Uh, but I, wa I want to give you a warning, that, which is not commonly appreciated uh, by, um, in this field. And that is actually people talk about non-Fermi liquid a lot. That you know, there's a Landau Fermi liquid, and you have, you have the multiplying body particles, the scattering rate. Landau condition is that the scattering, the lifetime has to be has to be uh, longer than you know, inverse lifetime has to be uh, uh, smaller than temperature. Okay, so this is obviously violates the Landau criteria. But in fact, it's been known for 60 years by, by the ancients uh, that you don't need. Landau fuzzy particle to derive Boltzmann equation. You can you can derive Boltzmann equation even without uh, without uh, quasi particles. Okay, why were they worried about this back in '64? Well, they were faced with the same problem because we have electron phonon scattering. Right? So at a high enough temperature, the, the scattering rate is lamb, is two pi lambda times t, right? And for strong coupling, is much big is bigger than kT. So we already Room temperature, we have violation of Fermi liquid theory. <coughs> but we talk about electrons all the time. Right? We don't worry that it's not not land out there. Right? And we, we treat uh, uh, transport with Boltzmann equation, and everything works. Right? So I already, you know, 60 years ago, these these clever people were asking that question, you know, and they were much cleverer than, than we. They they have the answer. The answer is that actually you don't need land out quasi particle. Uh, the simple idea is that as long as if Basic idea is that if your self energy is only frequency dependent and not no k dependent, then the <coughs> spectral function, even though it's very broad in energy space, is actually very narrow in momentum space. So you can use that fact to control your uh, Boltzmann equation derivation. So these guys work it all out, uh, and so uh, you know, thirty years later, a young back Kim, uh, student that I stole uh, for a while, they borrowed. Uh, we, 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 we just basically borrow what they uh, did and apply to this uh, uh, gauge theory in the context of the half-filled uh, land level, which is the same problem. Okay. So, so I just want to give you a warning that, you know, absence of land 
fuzzy product was not the end of the world. <coughs> okay, so what do we know about non-compact gauge theory? There's a couple of Fermi circuits. Well, in the early days, it was hoped that the theory can be controlled by one over n expansion, but we can just replicate uh, these uh, spin up and down but into uh, n copies. Uh, but that that was an important paper, paper by uh, Sonsi Kli again, uh, who said that this is not true, who proved that this is not true. Right? There's no one over n expansion. Uh, so all of this has to be kept. So that, of course, uh, put a damper, right? And not, we don't know what to do. Right? The, the essential idea is that the self digit correction is indeed a border one over n, right? But there are high order diagrams that are singular, and you need to cut them off to regularize them with the self energy, which is one over n. But now one over, one over is in the denominator, so it becomes large, right? So therefore, there's no one over n. I think that that's the way. It's, it's what? Yeah. I mean, the expansion is like uh, one over n times uh, one over n times one over omega. The actual expansion. I, so for the low omega, for low omega, yeah, they actually that work. One over n is uh, yeah. even the one over n can that work. Yeah. So usually, when you when you encounter that, you you can cut it off by the self energy. Okay. Right? But then it becomes one over n divided by one over n. Okay. <laughs> it's one. Yeah. So that that's what comes back to okay. Yeah. So. Um, but I think there was some uh, significant uh, development around uh, 10 years ago, or, uh, 5 to 10 years ago. Uh, there was a number of paper uh, employing this patch model. Uh, there was by Ali by Puchinsky, for example, Melitsky and such up here. They showed that there is a, the seventy has a, actually a, a high, when you go to higher order, it actually is a K dependence. For a long time, we thought it was an omega dependence. And, uh, uh, Central and collaborators uh, did a double expansion, one over n, and also an expansion around um, the critical, the, the scaling dimension of the of, of the boson. And uh, there was a uh, a very nice paper by Sonsi Lee again, who did what they call the co-dimensional expansion. Um, but this paper has a lot of reference, very long paper. So if you're interested in the topic, I would recommend that you uh, you read this because it uh, summarizes. And as far as I know, this is probably the the, uh, the last word on this on this topic. <laughs> uh, even though the problem is really not solved, I, I think people give up. So young people, young people who are energetic, uh, may want to back to this again. Okay, so now I, I uh, I'm done with the uh, theoretical part of the story. So I, I go to the experimental part. Okay. So the big question is, that where, where do I look for this spin liquid in, in real material? Can I really find examples of this spin liquid, right? So, because um, that's question is, say they maybe you don't care because we already have exactly solved it before. But uh, <clears throat> we like to have the real, real life examples. Okay, so there are really two routes now uh, to, to find these spin liquid. One is that, Back to the original Anderson's idea of frustration. Okay, so you want to look um, for a frustrated interaction. Uh, so originally Anderson thought about a triangle lattice, but this is not enough, right? Because in the Heisenberg model, the, the argument of frustration works only for the Heisenberg case when you have up and down spin. In the, in the Heisenberg case, they can form this 120 degree space, but everybody is compromised, and you can uh, and still have an L phase. So the next. Uh, more frustrated lattice is the cargo wave lattice that's shown here. Right? So that's, that's uh, more frustrated than the, than the triangle lattice. And, uh, and so there's a lot of work on, on this uh, pathetic, uh, material. Um, and, um, right. So actually, uh, right now, whether this system is gapped or. So I think there, there are two options for this. Uh, so, okay, first of all, it's known that this thing doesn't order down to low temperature to satisfy the uh, negative criterion for, for being a spin liquid. Um, and um, it can be gapped or, or direct uh, spin liquid. That question is still open. I think it's relevant the question whether it is that. Um, yeah, so I will not say any more about this today. Um, there is also a Kitaya honeycomb system. Kitaya is this on the honeycomb ladder that this famous model which is talked exactly. So, Amazingly, people manage to find a source state example that satisfy that kind of uh, uh, Hamiltonian. And um, 
there has been uh, claims recently on this particular material that it's actually a pyrospin liquid in the magnetic field uh, and has bulk out at the edge of uh, The other big class uh, along these lines are the pyrophores. So these are a pyrophore structure are made of this tetrahedron, and the spins are, have to point along the, towards the center, uh, but it can be have this two in, two out kind of configuration. So it's sometimes called a spin knife because there's a huge ground state degeneracy. The classical ground state is hugely degenerate. Okay. So the question is what happens when you have quantum? Uh, so apparently a lot of these are also uh, not ordered. And in, in 3D, unlike in 2D, you can have a Coulomb phase. Even, even if this, uh, the, the fermions are gapped, there's no confinement. So you can avoid confinement. So it's quite possible that this is happening. The, the problem with this system is that um, the energy scale is very low. Everything is controlled by the exchange energy. In the power core, the exchange energy is about five degrees. Uh, in the system that I, I'm considering, uh, they are like hundreds of degrees, or even maybe thousands of degrees. Okay. So it's very hard to do experiment because you really have to go to temperature several orders of magnitude lower than than the, the J to see this emergence behavior. So that, that's the problem. Um, right, so this is the first route. The second route, uh, which has shown a lot of promise, is to go near a modern state. Right. So, one, suppose you have a Mars transition, and let's imagine we are on the insulating side of the Mars transition. Right. So it's barely insulated. Right. It's not a strong insulator. So, in other words, the, the charge gap is small. Right? And, um, and, and yeah. so in that case, I think there's a, a good hope of finding a, sp a spin on Fermi surface, right? Because if you imagine a continuous phase transition, right? On one side, you have a, a metal which has a uh, full Fermi surface, half full Fermi surface. Yeah. If you um, release the pressure, if you like reduce the hopping, then this Fermi surface eventually disappears if you go into the hot phase. Right? So the question is, it's quite natural that this Fermi surface will leave behind some memory, and that memory Maybe may the spin on. Right. Now, you can imagine that the, that the charge component of this uh, Fermi surface gradually loses uh, its value. So, it, so it's kind of a, the charge part, uh, uh, it's lost, and, but you still look with the spin part. So it's just a kind of a mental picture. Right. But I think it seems quite promising that this is true. So, experiment indeed, this is a, turns out to be a very fruitful route. So, I think now there are two uh, systems. For a long time, the, the uh, poster child of this is the organic material, where you have large organic molecules that form a almost three-dimensional uh, two, uh, triangular lattice. So again, triangular lattice by itself is not enough to stabilize this spin liquid. But a triangular lattice close to the Mach transition may have a chance. Right? And I think there is experimental evidence that that actually and today I'm going to tell you a new example that uh, we kind of unearth uh, that we actually do the same thing. It's very simple. But this material is much more user friendly because organics are very hard to work with. Um, and uh, this is something that everybody knows how to make it. Excuse me. Yeah, I pray this organic has some controversy now. Yeah, I'll discuss it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me uh, first summarize uh, uh, the organic. So what is known? So these organic, as far as we're concerned, they form a slightly distorted triangular lattice, and uh, there's one unit of spin. It's about insulated. Okay. Um, right. So early work shows that the specific heat has a linear term, and the spin sensitivity goes to a constant at low temperature. So these are signs of a metal. Right. Remember, Fermi surface is a linear gamma, and it's very hard to get a linear specific heat otherwise than even sonic. For example, phonons give you TQ, you know, uh, uh, spin wave give you TQ, you know, or T squared, do not change. Right. So, uh, so we, we suggested that uh, it, uh, a motion H2, that, that, that the mechanism that drives this is approximately a transition. And one way of thinking about this is that Heisenberg model is no longer adequate. Right? So, not, morally, we still have local moments, but there would be higher order uh, uh, terms uh, when you do this T over U expansion. And one important one is the so-called ring exchange where the spins just run around. Uh, and then uh, that can change the physics. 
Okay, so so these, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is already kind of smoking guns for for a spin on perfect surface. But we get greedy, right? So we, people want to ask, are these objects mobile? Right? If you have a Fermi surface, they really should be mobile. Right? So how do you show that? Well, one way of showing that is to measure uh, thermal conductivity. Right? Uh, these things don't carry charge, but they carry heat because the spin carry entropy. Right? So the thermal conductivity should behave like a metal. That's the that's the prediction. Right? What does metal do? Well, the, generally, the thermal conductivity is a specific heat. Uh, times the velocity of the object times the mean three pi. Right? That's a general formula that you can find in uh, Ashcroft environment. And if I divide by temperature, C over T goes to a constant, right? We have a, uh, a linear specific heat. And if the mean three pi uh, is saturated by some disorder scattering or, or something, then this thing is predicted to go to a constant like a right? So in fact, uh, this was measured a uh, number of years ago by Krupp in Kyoto. And they indeed find a uh, linear term. So that makes me very, very happy. Uh, even more than that, uh, this linear term turns out to be extremely large. Right? This, this coefficient is extremely large. Because in two dimensions, you can actually directly extract this important combination, KFL. KF is a Fermi momentum time kind of L. This is a very important uh, um, dimensionless object that characterizes a, a Fermi liquid as far as the disorder scattering is concerned, right? So we know that if this parameter is one or less, then, then you have localization, right? If it's not, then you don't, then you have weak localization, right? So this is a localization parameter. But you can see that C over T in two dimensions is just a mass. So mass from VF is just KF. So you can unambiguously uh, tell what KFL is. So with the old data, KFL is 250, which is enormous, right? So it's too good to be true, almost. All right, so now, as, as Shaka mentioned in last year, this result has been disputed by two groups. And, uh, and now Yamashita himself uh, says that they can no longer reproduce their old uh, results. And they blame it on the samples that the, you know, it was grown by the same group, but the same group cannot grow the same samples again. So it's a mess. But I think there may be some light out of the chaos. But so let, uh, let me, I've been communicating with Thai Fair in the last uh, week or so. So this is what I, I understand now. So if you look at Tire Fair's data, which is posted on mine, uh, so again, he plus kappa over t over t. So the question is whether kappa over t extract to a finite value or a zero value. Okay, so this is very hard to tell. Okay, but uh, I think he, he would agree, he agrees that actually all this data uh, can extrapolate to something of a 0.02. <laughs> it's consistent. And actually, zero is not consistent within the zero function. Okay. Now, so 0 0.02 turns out to be 100 times smaller than the early event. But even if it's 100 times smaller, KFL is still 2.5. Okay. So morally, it's still barely mobile. I call this barely mobile. Uh, uh, spin so there's still a chance of some life. The distance has but interestingly, if you look more carefully at the data, there's another thing that just uh, stares at you. Uh, but, namely, this is a plot of kappa over t linearly in temperature. So that means that there's a linear term. Okay. Now, this linear term is very unusual. But it, if, usually, if you have an insulator, uh, the, the correction term goes as t squared, uh, t cubed. So it's a quadratic term. You mean kappa over t is t cubed, t squared. So this t linear term is very unusual, and but it is quite usual in metals. In metals, you find it uh, uh, linear. So I'm, not, I'm no longer talking about the intercept, but this slope. So this is this linear slope is quite unambiguous. Okay. Now, what is the origin of this uh, linear term in, in metals? Well, what we can do is to write uh, divide this into contribution, two contribution. One is from the fermions which has this linear T term. The other one is a phonon contribution. Again, it says phonon specific heat, which is TQ, uh, times the mean three pass. I can write the mean three pass as one over the scattering rate. Now, the scattering rate can have different origins. One is a boundary scattering, or a defect scattering, goes to a constant. And the usual one is TQ, and that's from anharmonicity, right? The phonon can scatter 
out of full knot. And T cube is because there's a probability of finding another full scalar. Now, if you have a Fermi surface, then there's a linear term in the scalar rate. The electron, the phonons can scatter off electron, and you just have to make particle excitation, and that's, what, that's why the scalar rate is linear T. Okay. So these red uh, things are due to uh, signatures of, of a Fermi surface, like for, for metals. Okay. So it turns out that this linear term is quite comparable to met metallic linear term. It's very similar. And uh, so you can now make a fit of this uh, using this formula. Uh, and um, so if you consider it a low temperature fit, uh, you can make a very nice fit. So there's a finite extrapolation, there's a linear term, and then there's a deviation because the T cube term is kicking in. Okay. And in fact, I can fit it over uh, up to 4 Kelvin. The data shows this uh, thing, a finite intercept, linear term, and then bending over to a T cube. So the competition between these terms gives me a peak, and this is a, the, the problem. So I think it looks, looks pretty nice. So I think the upshot of this is I think uh, this linear term may actually be evidence that there is a uh, Fermi surface. So we, we're getting at it not from the direct scattering of the Fermi in itself, but from the phonon. <coughs> so I think the conclusion is that these data are actually consistent with the Fermi surface, but a, a rather uh, not so mobile. So in the final few minutes, I want to talk about these new examples and show you some uh, really exciting data. Uh, so this is a 1T channel disulfide. Uh, this is a so-called layer transition metal dichalcogen. 1T means particular quality. You don't need to worry about the details. But the important thing is that all the action is on the tandem atoms, and they form a triangular lattice. So this is a, the model is a triangular lattice double form. You can start there. Okay? Now, now this guy, turns out, is a famous, has been studied uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, as a charge density of a material. It's a very famous guy. And there's a famous uh, distortion. But the distortion is that they form this so-called Star of David cluster. Right? So this is the uh, Star of David. Right? And so all these uh, atoms move towards the center of the Star of David. There's a distortion. Right? So you form a new unit cell. Now, the Star of David has 13 sites. 13 is odd, it's very important. So, just don't forget the one in the middle, right? The 12 around the edge is 13. So, this, this new unit cell has 13 <coughs> sites. Okay. You know, so, so I'm, I'm making these clusters. Okay. So, I call this a cluster mark insert. Right? Because on each cluster, so now I reduce my problem to clusters. On each cluster, there is a uh, odd number of, of electrons. So tandem uh, has one electron per site. So now 13 sites. Okay. Now the remarkable thing is that there are many, many hundreds of these uh, charge density material. This one is the only one that's insulating at low temperature. Everything else is metallic and right? undergo this transition. It's resistivity. But this is the only one. So we believe that this is a, a mod insulator. Okay. So. This is a mod insulator because, uh, so this by now this may be a familiar story. By making the unit cell large, I fold all the bands into the first free one zone. Okay. And as a result, I end up with very flat bands. Okay. So now you know all about twisted bilayer graphene. It's the same story. They make this more ray pattern. They have this flat band. And once you have flat band, then you form a mod insulator. The kinetic energy is small. Okay. So, so this is the granddaddy of, of graphene. <laughs> so, so we I can call this mod cluster mod uh, thing. Okay, so I think that was uh, already understood many years ago. But if I look at the beta data from a more modern point of view, then I realize that something very strange is happening. Because if you look at these spin susceptibility or any other um, data, there's no sign of local moments. Because usually you will have this local moment and you have the entire probability of change. The sign of local moment is a 1 over t in the spin-set right? And then it may be saturated due to uh, uh, theory wise. But if you look at data, uh, up to two, the 200 Kelvin is the creation of this uh, style of David. There's nothing. There's no, at a very low temperature, you have some tail due to uh, local moment, due to impurities. But if you have so many spins, one spin per 13 sites, 
who would have expected something like this? Okay. So the spins have disappeared. Okay. And uh, right. Okay. So in fact, now we have um, direct data showing these. Uh, now we have STM. Right. So people can actually image these star data. But this is STM data from uh, Ya Yu Wang's uh, group. And you can see that uh, you know these really form these uh, star data. Right? Now, nowadays, you don't have to imagine you can see with your eyes these uh, clusters. Right? So these are clusters. And they can do uh, a spectroscopy. And you can see that, uh, indeed, uh, it then, uh, this measures the local density of state. That is zero. Right? So it's an insulator. And there's a so-called upper Hubbard band and lower Hubbard band for the adding of removing cherries. Okay, so we, we proposed a few years ago uh, with uh, Vic Law that uh, even though this thing has been known for 45 years, it's actually a spin liquid. So the spin liquid actually has been with us for 45 years and nobody recognized it. So it's kind of a crazy uh, idea. Uh, right, so it turns out that uh, there, there's now a lot of evidence that this is actually true. And in fact, even better, that this may actually be a spin on Fermi surface. Okay. So what are the evidence? I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, if you do specific heat, uh, there's some temperature dependence which we understand in the favor of the chin sheet. But in high field, you, you saturate all the local moment. And the extrapolation gives you a finite but small uh, specific heat. So we claim that there is a spin the gamma. And very recently, uh, uh, a group in Shanghai, uh, in, uh, in US, uh, USD, uh, were able to do night shift. NMR measurement. So night shift has an advantage over, it's, it's a measure of spin susceptibility, but it has an advantage over pulse susceptibility because it doesn't pick up the local moment part. And they see that indeed there's a constant part. Right? So the uh, spin susceptibility indeed goes to constant. So these two things satisfy the thermodynamic uh, requirement of a, of, a, uh, of, uh, of a spin liquid. Now the same group that has this controversy did the thermal conductivity, and now they claim that there's a large uh, thermal uh, extrapolation. And again, they got attacked by the same people. Who says that? No, they don't see it. Right? So now it's a question of who has the better data. Because this is not a universal thing. Right? The thermal conductivity depends on the scattering rate. Okay. So they can always argue that my sample is better than your sample. Well, to, to Masuda's defense, recently they posted a paper where they show that if they intentionally disorder their pristine sample, they can make this thing go away. Okay, so at least give you a little bit more confidence. So I think it's an ongoing battle. But in the last few minutes, let me talk, talk about other possible predictions. Right? What else can we measure? Okay. One thing that we thought about some years ago, again, this is the, the other student that I, that I borrowed, Evelyn Tang, uh, from, from Jungar. Uh, we consider what is the uh, uh, spectrum, what is the dispersion of uh, our pets, right? So now the idea is that we have uh, spin charge separation. We have this fermion. The spins are carried by the fermion. The charge is carried by a gap boson. Right? So when you introduce an electron or remove a hole, you're actually adding a spin on and a, and a, and a, uh, and a gap boson. Right? So they, we have to convolve them uh, to get something. Well, so there's some uh, consequence. One obvious consequence is that, is that, first of all, the spectral function is broad, right? this is a convolution. And the second observation is that the cheapest way to make this excitation, the lowest energy excitation have, has to be a ring with radius kf, right? because I have to pay the price of making a boson. Uh, there's no choice. But I can make a zero energy uh, spin, spin a half at kf. So therefore, the minimum, the bottom of this is a, a, a KF. Okay? So as a result, the, the dispersion of this is, first of all, it, it, there's no, if you look at the bottom of the band, it should be a ring. So the way I picture this is a, uh, is a, um, a bagel. Right? If you take a bagel and slice it in half, then this part is the lower half of the band, and this is the upper half of the band. Right? Because it has a ring, the ring is a KF. Right? So, the skin of the bagel is the onset of the of the excitation, and the meat of the bagel is the uh, continuum. Okay. Since it's a lunch talk, I thought this is <laughs> right. And this is the upper data 
If you have some imagination, you can see that this is a K act. Okay? It maybe looks like a bagel, especially when you're hungry. <laughs> okay, but it gets better than that. Right? So we also talk about the possibility of forming a bound state. Right? Because these two guys have opposite gate charge. Right? The, the spin on and the and the whole on. They may want to attract, even though they're deconfined, and form a bound state. So it's possible to pull out a, a bound state. And it turns out that the data did show that. So remember, I showed you this early data of the uh, STM spectrum. But uh, recently, uh, um, Anaguri have improved the resolution. And if you look at this, you see, at the bottom of the upper half of there's a sharp peak. Now, this is very, very strange because you see this kind of bound state in optics. Then this will be called an exciton, right? Because you, you excite and you make an electron and fold. Right, and they form a hydrogenic atom. But here we're putting in one electron, right, by itself, or filling out electrons. Why, 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 why is it bound? Okay, so I think this is actually quite a strong signature of spin charge separation. That when you insert an electron, we're actually making an electron, the spin on and a, and, a, and a boson, which then form a bound state. So I think uh, that is very exciting. And now this, another question is, can we directly have experimental evidence of the Fermi momentum? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, there's been suggestion that maybe there's some SDM data, but that has been not been done so far. But very recently, uh, a group in Micromi has been studying a related material, tantalum diselenide. Okay. Now, this is very interesting material uh, because it has the same style of David structure, the same pattern. In the bulk, we see metal, but on the when you make a one-layer form, it's an insulate, it's a mod insulate. So again, this shows you that you're very close to, to a mod insulate, to a mod, to a to being metal. Okay, so the spectrum is very similar. Now what they observe, what they discover, and there's a paper that should be coming out of uh, hopefully soon. Uh, what they discover is a super modulation of the modulation. So you have this now David modulation, but on top of that, there's a another modulation. Right. They call it super super modulation. Right. So you can see that. So this is a STM scan. These dots are already not the original triangular S. These are the star of David. Okay. But if you go to some energy uh, near the Hubble band, they see some uh, something showing up, a new pattern showing up. Right. Now it's very hard to see these things in real space. Right. But if you Fourier transform, you can see that there are peaks. Take this thing and just Fourier transform. So what is the interpretation of this? So if you imagine that there's some, so I have a uh, fermion uh, Fermi surface. Let's imagine there's some kind of 2K F singularity. We don't know what it is, right? But Fermi surface uh, prone to having 2K F instability. Let's assume that there's a 2K F instability in the direction P1 and P2, okay? Now, when you have that, then it can induce a composite order, which is a charge order, which is at the back of sum of P1. So the picture is like this. So we, we know exactly what 2KF is, actually, because it's a half fill of the, of the star of David structure. So we, from the structure, we know exactly uh, what that 2KF is. Right? So you make that 2KF, 2P, and then you make the vector sum, you predict that you should have a charge density with at this Q. And this is exactly this Q. Right? So the circle, the middle of the circle, is, is predicted uh, by this 2KF. So if this interpretation is correct, then this is really a signature. It's a little bit indirect, but, but it's the first sign that there's a 2KF, there's a KF in this insulin. Right. So that's, uh, that's an amazing uh, story. Yeah, so I think the outstanding problem uh, from an experimental point of view is how do we see the gauge? Right. So I think now we have reasonably comfortable, uh, I'm of course biased, but I think we're confident that we're seeing uh, spin on purpose, uh, spin on. But can you see the gauge? Can you see that? Uh, um, so there's some uh, very nice idea by Mochonich, who says that an external magnetic field can induce a gauge magnetic field, right? Because the bisymmetry is allowed, and in practice they are allowed. So, and the spin on sees a gauge magnetic field, so they should be quantum oscillations. So if you measure magnetization, they should have these uh, quantum oscillations. Well, this has been looked for, as I have not seen, unfortunately. We predicted a kind of thermal Hall effect, 
I gained uh, using this idea that the uh, magnetic field use a gauge magnetic field. And again, people look for them and haven't seen it again. We predicted some kind of uh, in, inside the gap uh, absorption. And naively, you have a, have a charge gap. So inside the charge gap, there should be no electromagnetic absorption. Right? But because we have spin-ons, right, they are a gapless object. Now, they don't carry a charge. Uh, so they don't directly couple the electric field, but they couple the gauge electric field. So again, an external electric field, electromagnetic wave, can induce the gauge electric field, which uh, gives this. So this has been possibly been observed in one of these organics, uh, but you know, it took it be quite quite a bit of data analysis and uh, so on. Okay, so I think this is the uh, this is the challenge to uh, more to the experimental than the people in this room. But to people in this room, I think what, what we need to do is what the theory is to propose more practical, more experiments for, for people with, with direct consequences of PhD. That's, that's the missing link. Excuse me. Yeah. For people like experimentalists measure like how many independent gabbles nodes like count for good reason. Yeah, but no, you can't even see them. Right? But well, these gauge fields are highly damped. They're over damped, first of all. And uh, they don't directly couple. Right. How do you couple them? Yeah, that's exactly the question. How do you couple them? These are both fictitious gauge fields. Right? We, we manufacture them, but somehow they have a life. Yeah. What was the T to the two thirds prediction way earlier? Um, yeah, the T to the two thirds. Uh, I think right now, the uh, yeah, that would have been nice, but I think existing data, it's very hard to distinguish between T and T to the two thirds. Right? You need many decades. And I think the existing data is not enough. So that in principle, in should, principle what should have applied to the t exactly. that you were showing us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But over a limited range, you cannot count. And that would have been a good prediction for the yeah, But wouldn't, when you plot it as cap over t, wouldn't that lead to upturn? Like yeah, but I think it would be so small that I mean, people are not even sure that they are safe. So I think these are experimental issues. Is the data on the number so far? Why is it not consistent with a Z2 gauge? It could be a spin on Fermi surface, but a Z2 gauge. Z2? Yeah. A gap gauge. Well, yeah. it's gapless, right? We have data. We have in but it, so they can have spin on Fermi surface, but the gauge field can be gapless. Uh, that would be unusual. I think you need some pairing, gapless pairing. Yeah. But it's possible. Yeah. Okay. But possible. the data doesn't suggest anything. Well, we don't know. I see. Yeah. In fact, no. I've been pushing for this pair density wave. That would be exactly the example where you have a Z2 gauge field. With a partial yeah. So I, I should stop here. So I think it's been, this field is coming of age, uh, just like I am. <laughs> and we have more examples uh, coming online. And uh, so there, I think there are plenty to do experimentally. And also, I think there's a lot of theoretical questions that, that can be addressed. Why do you expect it to be small, uh, except at very low temperature? Yeah, so it doesn't have to be small, but uh, in practice they are all very small. In most, uh, in most uh, insulators, it's not difficult to get to the boundary limits. Okay. Yeah, in practice, you do if you, go, uh, you deal with this uh, fermion scatter. Uh, yeah, so they are all limited boundary. In that case, you see a T2. So, so the, the behavior is very uh, strange. So it would look like this. And then it comes down. One of the T on this side. A couple of T. I guess it's T square. There's a big peak at the temperature. But this guy is much smaller. It's more like this. So something else is scattering. Um, and does the similar feature show up in Shi and Lee's data? That I haven't, I haven't looked at. Okay. But they're very similar to 
Shen is totally consistent with time period. But I, I would think so, yeah. I, but I have when you mentioned about the bounce tape, yeah. the speed on the yeah. but which part of the spectrum is the signature I am? Yeah, let me uh, go back. <clears throat> yes. <That's... coughs> yeah. so which part? Yeah, so there's a really small. Ah, <laughs> uh, I see. Yeah, so. so that's the real. That's real. <laughs> 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 Several major ones. Actually, the story is even better than this. Because, um, I wasn't going to show you this. So sometimes they even see replicas. So these are interpreted as phone on sidebands of this phone on Yeah, they, they now have actually identified this phone on. It's a, actually a, a amplitude mode of this charge of this sound David. So there's a mode in exactly at this frequency. So, so I think this is a pretty strong evidence. So what's the difference between red and the blue? Yeah, they're different surface. You know, SDM you go to different different, different positions, and the different parts. Uh, we, uh, is where the, where the cleavage oh. is the stacking between okay. the sound yeah. so, so in the red plot, there are like several peaks. Yeah, these side bands, yeah. So the interpretation is that this, this is the power state, and these are shake up of phonons. Ah, I phonon see. side bands. Yeah. So actually, even mm -hmm. here, you can see that there are some yeah. bands there. Yeah. So in the blue one, there is no side bands, but in the red one. Well, you cannot see it. Yeah, it's not clear. So it's pretty convincing that these are sharp peaks. It's not too much. Yeah. See, if I just look at this plot, it looks like the binding energy for the red and blue curves are quite different. You know? Yeah, yeah. So the gap is smaller on those surfaces. But it looks like it's still a mud gap. No, but I, I just mean the, the lowest energy sharp peak compared to, say, the, the peak of the upper hopper band. That's like an estimate for the binding energy of the... Oh, yeah, energy. you mean the, the binding, yeah. Yeah, it like the red curve has a much bigger binding energy. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know, those are details that I... Yes, it may not be so... It may not be that safe to uh, to use this as an estimate of the binding, because I think the bottom of the band is really huge. It's here, not, not here. The peak is not the bottom of the band. Right? The, the peak structure comes from this convolution. We have a broad band. So the bottom of the band is really a sh something sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you mean it, it's the other way to formulate this? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a job for you. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, I think there's no, right? Shakam may know best. It's the other way of uh, coming to this. Uh, that's this case theory. Is that that's the question, right? Is that without doing the part on construction? Yeah. In some sense, you 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 constrain if you constrain your hair space, you may have a constrained hair space. Yeah. And the fluctuation within the constrained hair space may may give you some kind of string or membrane like yeah. object. And yeah. that may that may be another way to look yeah. at this. Okay, so he knows the other yeah. <laughs> You can ask him. I, I don't know yet. But there must be other way. Okay. Good. Alright. Any more questions? So, for those who have taken this uh, A511, A512, thank you for attending Professor Lee's and our lectures. And thank you for the Well, uh, just in Colorado.
Thank you.